In this lecture, we will discuss certain disease conditions that are associated with the stomach. Here we have a fig figure of our stomach. We can see it is a J-shaped structure and it is located in our upper left abdomen. One important function of our stomach is to receive, process, and pass along the food bolus from the esophagus. Here we have the entry from the esophagus into the stomach. And this entry is controlled by the gastroesophageal sphincter, also called the lower esophageal sphincter, or LES. If this sphincter structure is incompetent, then we will have GERD, the gastroesophageal reflux disease, which we talked about in our lecture on esophageal diseases. Once the food arrives in the stomach, there will be a lot of um, motion going on and different portions of the muscle on the stomach walls will be uh, mechanically mixing the food with the secretions from the stomach. Then it will eventually pass through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum bit by bit. The stomach has a lot of active secretions in to the food that it pr processes. For example, in the gastric juice, we have the hydrochloric acid which makes the pH in the stomach very low. It can be as low as two, so this is very acidic. And there are many different types of cells in the stomach that are responsible for secreting different components, ranging from intrinsic factor, which is essential for normal vitamin B12 absorption, and mucus, which is important in protecting the stomach tissue from damage. There are also digestive enzymes, such as pepsinogen, which is the pre-enzyme form that becomes activated by the acidity or low pH. And this enables the digestion of proteins to begin in the stomach. The secretion of gastric juice is released in three phases. First is the cephalic phase, followed by the gastric phase. When we visually see or smell food, even before the food items arrive in the stomach, our body is already reacting. Our brain is processing the image, the stimuli and signals to the stomach so that our cells are already having an increase in secretion in anticipation of the arrival of the food. Obviously, this is helpful for for digestion because when the food arrives, the enzymes and other components are already there. Then when the food does arrive in our stomach, it will further stimulate the secretion. So this is direct contact with the food and that would be the gastric uh, phase. So these two phases here, are stimulatory, meaning that the secretions by the stom stomach increases during these two phases. The last one is the intestinal phase. This is where the food chyme, after being processed by the stomach, begins to enter the duodenum. And this phase is inhibitory. So when the intestines start to receive food chyme, it will send a feedback signal to decrease the, secre decrease the secretion of gastric juice. The receiving of the food by the intestine signals the stomach that the chyme is being received and tells the stomach that it can decrease its secretions. This is a coordination of different sections of the D GI tract so that we can process food more efficiently. There is both mechanical and chemical digestion in the stomach. However, as we 
already learned in previous courses for adults, the digestion of lipids and carbohydrates are extremely limited in the stomach. The main thing we are talking about in terms of digestion is the digestion of protein in the stomach. The pepsinogen, uh, which is the preenzyme secreted into the stomach, is activated by the gastric acid. The acidity converts it to the active form, which will start digesting protein. Also, the low acidity in the stomach also helps denature proteins, making digestion easier. As for absorption, um, the absorption of the nutrients is also very limited in the stomach. We actually can only absorb a small amount of water. No nutrients can be absorbed. The exceptions are alcohol, and this is because the ethanol molecule does not require any digestion. It can be taken into our bloodstream intact, and this process can begin as early as in the stomach. And this can explain some of the well-known effects of alcohol. For example, if someone drinks on an empty stomach, then this person can get drunk really fast. This is because with an empty stomach, there is nothing else in there to dilute the alcohol. Also, this can be caused by overconsumption of alcohol over a short period of time where there is a lot of alcohol entering the bloodstream in this um, short amount of time. In addition, certain medications uh, can also be absorbed in the stomach. The first condition that we will look at that is associated with the stomach is nausea and vomiting. Obviously, this is a very unpleasant symptom, and it can be a reason why many patients seek medical assistance. Nausea and vomiting can be caused by different factors, for example, drugs, toxins, or food contamination. In addition to these, metabolic stress or extreme emotion can also lead to this reaction. So we can think of maybe a time we've heard someone saying that they, you make me sick. Sometimes this is a very literal description. Maybe we think we can't believe what we heard about something a person has done. Some people will literally throw up because of it. In some cases, nausea and vomiting is not the primary disease, and it could be a result of, the more, of a more threatening disease. For example, many people with brain injury, whether it's from trauma or brain cancer, or maybe they had a hemorrhage, a stroke, the intracranial pressure gets so high, it adds pressure to the center that controls for the nausea and vomiting reaction. In that case, patients will throw up. So this is obviously not a GI condition to begin with. We would need to control the root cause. And this is actually one of the signs that they look for if someone has been hit in the head and may have a concussion, though it may take a good amount of time before the vomiting and other symptoms occur. So for patients with nausea and vomiting, we really need to first investigate what the underlying cause is and then treat it accordingly. We do have certain medications that we can use to inhibit this reaction. However, some medications are temporary, so we really want to find and treat the underlying cause. If someone has prolonged vomiting, uh, in severe cases, they may start to vomit blood, which is hematemesis. Also, because the gastric contents being expelled have a lot of fluid, the person may become dehydrated. Also, due to the acidity of the gastric acid, they are losing a lot of protons, and this could lead to acid-base imbalances. And 
for someone that has prolonged vomiting, their dietary intake would be poor. So malnutrition would be a concern. And for certain people during the process of vomiting, they may accidentally inhale part of the contents into the airway, and this could cause aspiration pneumonia. This can be very dangerous for patients, um, maybe if they're in a coma, but have a vomiting reflex and they're not aware, or in elderly nursing home patients that may be very weak and can't do anything to prevent it, they can get this very life-threatening condition. And then in really severe cases, the stomach could literally break or rupture. When it comes to nutrition interventions for nausea and vomiting, here are some of the general principles. Uh, these are pretty straightforward to read through. Um, we can pay attention here to the first section um, which says to uh, first suck on ice chips if over three years of age because we don't want young children to choke on the ice chips. If tolerated, we can start adding these amounts in liquid form and observe and then increase again if tolerated. This strategy is very common for any GI condition when we transition a patient from nothing by mouth to a clear liquid diet or to a soft diet than solid diet. The instructions would be advanced as tolerated. When we talk about parenteral or enteral nutrition and weaning off the nutrition support and resuming oral intake, this term advanced as tolerated is something we frequently use in our nutrition prescription. For people that have nausea and vomiting, especially if it is prolonged, they may have inadequate intake, dehydration, and the other issues we discussed. In addition, some people may have learned food aversions where whatever the patient remembers eating that preceded the episode, they may begin to avoid it afterwards because of the associated memory. This is something we need to pay close attention to, especially in cancer nutrition. People on chemotherapy can have severe GI reactions, including nausea and vomiting. One principle of feeding cancer patients undergoing chemo treatment is that we don't want to force or encourage them to eat anything during um, the time they are suffering from these symptoms. Otherwise, they may associate the bad feeling of nausea and vomiting with the food item or beverage we tried to force or encourage them to consume. And even when the side effects are gone post-chemo, they still don't want to touch it because whenever they see or smell the food, they remember how bad it was during chemo. So please keep this in mind. And then for nutrition diagnosis, the problems could be altered GI function. This is a very typical one. It could be involuntary weight loss. Remember that malnutrition could be a risk. Um, there's also inadequate fluid intake and inadequate oral intake overall. Then for the nutrition intervention, we will have that strategy we discussed to replenish fluid and food. We also want to minimize symptoms and discomfort and maintain nutritional status. So we'll want to think about what the potential problems are and then this will help set our goal for the intervention to correct or prevent them. Now on to gastritis. This is the inflammation of the gastric mucosa. Uh, this is the mucosa of the stomach. Now remember when we discussed the diseases of the oral cavity, we came across another term called stomatitis. And we emphasize that the word means the inflammation of the mucosa in the mouth cavity, not the stomach 
although the spelling is very similar. But the inflammation of the stomach mucosa is called gastritis, as we see here. Um, acute inflammation of the stomach mucosa is typically related to infection. Again, we are talking about food contamination, uh, biological contamination. It can also be associated with other things we ingest, including alcohol, food poisoning, and the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Then the chronic gast gastritis. So type A um, is related to pernicious anemia, which is caused by a vitamin B12 deficiency. And then we have type B, which is caused by a bacterial infection and the bacteria responsible is called H. pylori. And pylori is the exit from the stomach into the duodenum, the pyloric sphincter, and this is where this type of bacteria is found. Type B gastritis is more severe, and studies indicate that H. pylori infection is associated with an increased risk for stomach cancer, so we want to be sure to address it. And this right here is what the H. pylori bacteria looks like. The injury or infection in the condition disrupts the protection of the gastric mucosa. Remember, one of the things secreted by the cells of the stomach is the mucus that protects the lining of the stomach. This is why, although the environment inside the stomach is very acidic, the acid is not burning the wall of the stomach itself under normal conditions. But if we have injury or infection, as in this case, that disrupts this layer of protection, and this could allow for the acid to go under this layer of protection and cause damage to the walls of the stomach. This can also open the door for ulcers, which we will be discussing gastric ulcers next. The symptoms of gastritis include belching, anorexia, the loss of appetite, abdominal pain, because at this time we could literally be suffering from acid burning in the stomach. There may also be vomiting or belching. So if the acid erodes too much of the stomach wall, you can have blood coming out. So same as in nausea and vomiting, we want to treat the underlying cause. If it's poisoning, then we need to detox. If it is a drug-related condition, we can discontinue the drug. If it is pernicious anemia, we can correct that with adequate B12, um, with B12 injection if necessary. And then, of course, if it's H. pylori, we would address the infection. Related to gastritis is peptic ulcer disease, or PUD. By definition, we know that for an ulcer, a certain surface is eroded. So the definition of PUD is ulcerations of the gastric mucosa that penetrates the submucosa. We know that the walls of the GI tract have different layers. So starting at the inside, we have the mucosa and then the submucosa, and then further outwards, we get the smooth muscle layer. Again, the first layer is the mucosa. So when we see the penetration that reaches the second layer coming from the lumen side, then we have PUD. This is a very common disease. Um, and each year in this country, it accounts for over 600,000 or over half a million healthcare visits and over 350,000 hospitalizations. H. pylori is also associated with this. 
some data indicates that 70% of gastric ulcers are caused um, are associated with the H. pylori infections. Again, this bacteria is also the cause of type B gastritis. And for duodenal ulcers, 90% are caused by H. pylori. So this is just a very bad bacteria. For clinical manifestations, we may have gastric pain, pain in the stomach region. It may be a burning sensation, and this description is very accurate because literally acid is burning the stomach tissue due to the penetration. To diagnose this, in the past, they would have done an x-ray to see how the barium paste goes through the stomach and then see if there is anything in the mucosa layer missing. Um, however, now it's usually done with an endoscopy, which is better because it can take a biopsy at the same time. So we know that chronic ulcers caused by H. pylori can increase the risk for stomach cancer. So we would want to be able to take a sample to check if there is a change in the pathology of the cell type while we are doing the endoscopy to diagnose PUD. Then for treatments, we um, use medications to treat H. pylori and um, since its discovery back around in the 1980s, we have more than one medication that can deal with this bacteria. So we can treat the infection, which is the root cause. Since the root cause is bacteria, but the damage is directly done by the acid burning the soft tissue, um, we would want to, at the same time, control the symptoms and the damage, so we would want to suppress the acid secretion. And remember, when we talked about GERD, we mentioned quite a few medications with this effect, so please review those. People with PUD usually have impaired oral intake and unintended weight loss along with nutritional imbalances. So by now we should know what are the proper nutrition um, problems for this type of thing. Uh, so hopefully it's becoming more routine and easy to identify. So inadequate oral intake, fluid intake, unintended weight loss, malnutrition, and altered GI function. All of those are valid problems for the PES statement. For intervention, we have medical treatments, so we want to support those with our nutrition intervention. We want to maintain or improve the patient's nutritional status, although the disease does put the patient at a high risk for malnutrition. We also wanna help minimize symptoms that the patient suffers from, like the pain and burning sensations, since people who feel this will likely not have a good appetite and um, then they won't have adequate dietary intake as a result. Similar for the nutrition intervention for GERD, nutrition therapy for PUD also needs a trial restriction of food. The patient needs to be educated on which foods are known to cause the exacerbation of the symptoms. Again, this is very similar to GERD because both conditions have damage done by acid from the stomach, so the same foods need to be taken into consideration. For example, coffee stimulates acid secretion, therefore many patients with this history will go ahead and eliminate coffee from their diets, or even tea, uh, things with caffeine. Alcohol is also a well-known factor that stimulates gas gastric acid secretion. And, you know, then some people will think that because the damage in PUD is done by gastric acid, that they should avoid acidic foods like orange juice because they think it will hurt more. 
Now, it does sound logical. However, evidence indicates that the pH of the food has little effect on this condition. If we think about this, even without consuming any acidic foods, the gastric acid itself can reach a very low pH, as low as two. And what food item that we can actually consume can reach that low? So although orange juice and maybe some other citrus juices are acidic with low pH, it is not as low as the natural pH within the stomach, therefore you won't cause more damage. So it does make sense that the evidence now shows that the pH of foods has little effect. Then during the trial period or even long term, patients should keep records to see what works and doesn't work for them. And also if there are any food items that they cannot tolerate, they need to make note and avoid it. So this would be part of the nutrition education especially if we think food and nutrition related knowledge is part of the problem. Here's a summary of nutrition therapy for peptic ulcers. So our patients may have a lot of questions about foods and we want to be able to give them examples of what food or food groups are recommended and then what should be um, avoided or maybe reduced. So please read through this table carefully. To monitor and evaluate PUD therapy, we want to check the adequacy of nutritional intake because of the risk of malnutrition posed by PUD. And also we need to check and follow up on the tolerance of the oral diet and specific foods and beverage items.